Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Adelaide Biomed City um, Research Mini Reviews. This week it's going to be summary on atherosclerosis. We are blessed here in South Australia with uh, key investigators who have really been leading um, important research into, into vascular biology, um, obviously basic salmon. And today we're going to hear from Chris Universal. Chris has been doing um, some excellent work in um, atherosclerosis and angiogenesis and, and particularly impacting uh, diabetes and having organ this in the past. And then after that, um, we are going to hear from Associate Professor Peter Saltis, a clinical and interventional cardiologist who has been able to do an, an enormous amount of work in that difficult role of being able to know clinical care with, uh, with uh, hard-nosed basic science and he will be talking to us about fundamental discoveries to clinical practice targeting new molecular and cellular players in vascular disease. So I might hand over now to uh, Chris um, uh, and what we might do is um, actually have both of the speakers and then field questions at the end of that, I think is the plan. So Chris, thank you very much. All right, okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Derek. Thanks for everyone joining and for the invitation. So I'm just gonna share my screen now and. Um, Hope that works. Okay, is that's not working? Ah, it might still. Hang on. It's just um, should be, ah. Here we go. All right. And it's working, Chris. Just right. Yeah, it is a little slower. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. So. Um, so what do we do at the Vascular Research Centre? So I co-direct that with Peter Soldis, who's the other speaker today. We look at both atherosclerosis and angiogenesis. So for those of you who don't know, atherosclerosis is this build-up of fatty, fatty plaque within the blood vessels of the heart. And angiogenesis is the process of new blood vessel formation. And um, certainly they have overlapping functions um, in cardiovascular disease through to wound healing, which I'll attempt to try and explain in this slide. So firstly, when atherosclerotic plaques block up the blood vessels in the heart, what it does is it um, restricts the flow of oxygen carrying blood through to certain areas of the heart tissues and creating regions of low oxygen concentration or ischemia. Now there should be an angiogenic response to this ischemia and certainly a bit of an individual's ability to effectively grow new blood vessels at these sites really uh, help to improve the long-term prognosis. Now, atherosclerosis also forms in the blood vessels of the legs or the femoral arteries called peripheral arterial disease. And uh, your ability to grow new blood vessels around these blockages can prevent uh, necrosis, for example, of the toes or in more extreme events, prevent um, amputation of the lower limbs. Also, this restricted th flow through uh, caused by peripheral arterial disease can impair wound healing. And um, your ability to grow new blood vessels back to these sites really helps support the healing process. So these are all interconnected uh, through different vascular types of diseases. And in the Vascular Research Centre, we have a range of different models that can address all aspects of this, which I'll describe now. So firstly, in atherosclerosis, we have this, what we call the standard kind of stable plant model. You need a specific genetically modified knockout animal for these. We have both different types in our lab. And in this, we just feed mice a high fat diet. So they develop these atherosclerotic plaques throughout that aortic vasculature. We've also recently established this unstable plant model at SAMRI through our collaboration uh, with people at the Baker Institute in Melbourne. The unstable plaque is uh, plaques that are prone to rupture, which can cause these sort of sudden uh, acute events uh, that can lead to heart attack and stroke and sudden death. Uh, mice uh, don't naturally have this unstable plaque phenotype. They don't develop that. So it has to be surgically induced. We've also established now a very complex model, which uh, represents this instant neoatherosclerosis. It's a slightly newer phenomenon caused by the more later generation of drug eluting stents. Uh, and occurs more rapidly. Uh, the stents are these metal cages placed in arteries that have been blocked by atherosclerosis as opposed to reopen them. So this model should help understand some of the underlying questions about that process. 
Now, in angiogenesis, we also have models. The first is this model of myocardial infarction. So we ligate the main uh, artery of the heart here to create the ischemic region. We can then track changes in cardiac function. Uh, following this, you know, in response to therapy or your gene of interest, um, and also track new blood vessel formation in the heart. We also have well-established this Heimlin ischemia model, which reflects peripheral arterial disease. Here we tie off and actually remove the femoral artery and then track the rate of new blood vessel formation within the leg of these mice using the laser Doppler perfusion imager that we have here at Samarang. And finally, my group have established this neuron model of wound healing, which we think has significant advantages over the leading models out there at the moment. Um, and within this model, we can also track uh, wound angiogenesis using the laser doctor. So I think these are the key models that we've established in the Vascular Research Centre. So if anyone's interested, please contact us. So I'm now going to touch on two projects in my laboratory. One is to do with atherosclerosis and one with angiogenesis, which I think introduces a few more different techniques and methods from our lab. So the first of these uh, is led by my PhD student, Victoria Nankavell. It's about uh, nanoparticles called porphosomes. They were initially uh, developed by Professor Gang Zen, a collaborator in Toronto, and they're special because in their outer shell, they contain porphyrin lipid, which is highly fluorescent, so it gives it excellent imaging capabilities. It can also be uh, bound to uh, copper 64 to enable PET imaging. Also within these porphosomes is a mimetic peptide that allows targeting to the macrophages within atherosclerotic plaques. They're the key cell types in plaques, and also this targeting enables uh, therapeutic effects. And finally, these porphosomes can have drugs loaded within their core. So they really are multifunctional uh, little particles for imaging and therapy. So we've been working with them for over a year, and these are just some of the key bits I wanted to show today. So in vitro, we've incubated these porphosomes with our macrophages, looked under the confocal microscope, and we see they really take up the porphosomes very well, and they are very bright. Also, we're very pleased to see these porphosomes are excellent at removing or effluxing cholesterol from cholesterol-laden macrophages. This is a very important anti-atherosclerotic function. It does it nearly twice as well as our own endogenous cholesterol effluxer, which is HDL, also known as the good cholesterol. Uh, finally, porphosomes have really uh, striking anti-inflammatory effects on a number of different chemokines and cytokines. Uh, we've just chosen our interleukin-1 beta here, but we can see it has potent effects in the presence of the inflammatory stimulus LPS. So moving on to its imaging capabilities. So um, here at Samway, we've got this biofluorescence in vivo imaging system. Um, here we have uh, two mice. They've been fed the high fat diet. So they have atherosclerotic deposits in their vasculature. And um, they, um, in, and this is in sorry, the aortic arch, which I'm attempting to highlight here. And in the mouse that's been uh, received porphosomes, you really see that it lights up these mice and there are hot spots in around here in the arch region where we know the plaque is deposited. We can excise out various parts of the aortas and we can see those mice infused with porphosomes really light up under the ivus in appropriate places. Also in cryo sections of the aortic sinus at the top of the heart, uh, and I'm outlining the plaques within the sinus here, we can see these porphosomes really track specifically to the atherosclerotic plaques and using the confocal, they're also very bright, which is very promising. We've also incorporated PET imaging. So here at SAMRI, um, using the cyclotron uh, and the core facility METRU, they have been fantastic at helping us. They make the copper 64 and then they radiolate all the nanoparticles. After infusion, we then do the PET images. So just for those who haven't seen PET imaging, this is a mouse on its back, this is one on its side, and this is a cross-section through the heart. Uh, one mouse has just been fed a chow, normal chow diet, so it does not have atherosclerosis, and one does have atherosclerosis because it's been fed the high-fat diet, and they both receive porphosomes. So in these PET images, we can see there is non-specific um, uh, targeting to the liver. That's quite common for nanoparticles. But the heart also does light up. And it appears that the ones with atherosclerosis are brighter. And when we do analyse the heart volume of interest, we see a much greater PET signal compared to the child control. So we have a lot more work to do looking at these porphosomes, but they've certainly shown very promising both imaging and therapeutic effects so far. 
So the second project I wish to go through is our one on angiogenesis. We're looking to correct defects in endothelial cell metabolic reprogramming that we believe occur in diabetes. And this might be an underlying mechanism for the impairment in angiogenesis that occurs in diabetes. So our target of interest here is a mitochondrial enzyme called PDK4. So what PDK4 normally does in the face of hypoxia in an endothelial cell is that it increases its expression. So it does this to shut down in a mitochondrial metabolism, so the TCA cycle, which uh, uses a lot of oxygen. And it does this to preserve the cells, so it is less likely to undergo apoptosis. And we hypothesize it'll make it more likely to participate in angiogenesis, but that link hadn't been previously made before. We also hypothesized that diabetes would impair this response to hypoxia. So this project is being led by my PhD student, Kalia Primer. She won the three-minute thesis contest for the Uni Hall of University of Adelaide, so it may seem familiar. Um, and what Kalia found firstly was that it does look like PDK4 plays a role in angiogenesis. So what she did, she knocked it out using siRNAs. Uh, she knocked out PDK4 in endothelial cells and then subjected them to uh, in vitro angiogenesis functional assay or a vascular network formation. And she found that in the face of both hypoxia and in high glucose, it really impairs the vascular network formation of these endothelial cells. Also, we found that high glucose and also diabetes in some in vivo studies causes inadequate mitochondrial responses to hypoxia. So firstly, uh, what we find is that in normal glucose, which is this five millimolar, in response to hypoxia, we get this nice induction of PDK4 as we'd expect, and a nice shutdown of the ox oxygen consumption or the respiration of the endothelial cells. This was measured using the seahorse bioanalyzer. But what happens in high glucose at 25 millimolar in response, response to hypoxia, we don't get uh, such a great incremental increase in PDK4 or such a great reduction in the respiration. We believe this might underlie why there's an impairment of angiogenesis in diabetes. We also believe that PDK4 is a targetable modifier, so a modifiable target. And from recent data, what Kalia has found using a lentiviral overexpression of PDK4 is that it can actually rescue high glucose impaired vascular formation in this angiogenesis um, in vitro assay. So where we're going next, we're trying to translate this, these findings into our key in vivo angiogenesis models. We're working with a really interesting lentiviral uh, construct which enables endothelial cell-specific overexpression, which is on and off, a TET on and off inducible. So we can really control its expression and then eventually we're very keen to sort of translate this into sort of diabetic foot ulcers, for example, and I have a great collaboration with Robert Fittridge at uh, the RPA and doing the trial with him at the moment. So um, finally, um, I'd just like to thank the leadership team at the Vascular Research Centre and all the uh, workers in my lab that um, do all the, uh, the hard hours. So thank you very much. Wow, that's, uh, that's a lot of work there. <laughs> you did well, Chris, really well. What we might do is uh, we'll let um, Pete uh, talk well, about share. Yeah. research. And then we might take questions at the end. So thank you very much for that, Chris. Over to you, Pete. No worries. I'm just going to yeah, here we go. Stop the share. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Oh. All right. Let me know how this goes, guys. Are you um, able to see my slides yet? Great. Well, thanks, Derek. Thanks, Chris. Chris, that was a fantastic segue to my talk as well. So I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, like Chris, my research program looks at two core elements. The first is the study of novel mediators of atherosclerosis with a view to developing new treatments. But more broadly, my group's really interested in the intersection of inflammation uh, and particularly macrophage led inflammation and new blood vessel formation. Um, and we do so to study not just atherosclerotic diseases such as myocardial infarction or peripheral vascular disease, but also, as Chris described, to get outside of the heart and the blood vessels and look at wound healing and most recently cancer. Now, uh, as Derek said, I'm a clinician. I spent a number of years trying to learn basic science outside of the clinic. Uh, and so the program that I run does as much as possible have a bench to bedside element. Uh, we very much look at fundamental and mechanistic discovery, but always with an eye to how that might translate to treatments of our patients. 
The tools that we use uh, really spread across a variety of techniques. We do a lot of uh, bench and small animal work. About 70% of my group's work uh, is using mice, including a number of the models that Chris described. Increasingly, we're moving to uh, omic technology, and we're also lucky enough through collaborations at Callan and more recently the Women and Children's to be establishing uh, blood and tissue biobanks. As much as possible, we try to align uh, that information with clinical data from registries and trials. Uh, now, I don't have time to go through the various programs that we're um, engaged in, but this is just a scatter diagram of, of some of the topics that uh, my team are studying. The ones in navy blue here are um, projects that my own staff are leading. Uh, the ones in colour are collaborative projects with other members within the Biomed City precinct and outside. And down here in orange are clinical trials, both industry and NHMRC uh, sponsored trials that I'm either leading or, or integrally involved in. What I'd like to do today is to use the next few minutes to highlight one program of work that my group um, has been engaged in now for about six years and that we are trying to take very much from the bench to the bedside. And this is a, a program which explores this association between inflammation and neovessel formation and how it applies to different disease processes. And we do so through the lens of development of macrophages and endothelial cells through a shared stem cell that our group has discovered in various tissues, both in mice and humans. And these stem cells are called hemangioblasts. Now we first have to recognize that when new blood vessels form, as Chris described, um, innate immune cells, particularly macrophages, play a key role in assembling around endothelial cells and providing both paracrine and structural anastomotic support. So without a good macrophage response, new blood vessel formation uh, does not occur. Now, in some conditions, uh, this is a good thing. So when we describe the collateralization and tissue repair after ischemia or infarction, we want this neovascularization to take place, similarly after wound injury. But in other situations, uh, this is maladaptive or pathogenic. So in atherosclerosis, the formation of inflamed plaques is made worse by neovascularization of those plaques through the infiltration of microvessels called vasa basura that destabilize the plaque. Similarly, those of you who work in cancer will recognize that tumor associated macrophages are involved in the angiogenesis that leads to cancer growth and spread. So our group has explored this relationship between macrophages and endothelial biology in our vascularization by looking at the development of both cell lineages. If we look at macrophages, our traditional teaching was that tissue resident macrophages predominantly come from the recruitment of blood monocytes that differentiate in tissues to macrophages. And in turn, those monocytes arise through a pathway called definitive hematopoiesis in postnatal bone marrow. Now, over the last decade, several very high impact studies have demonstrated that in different tissues in the body, uh, the brain, the liver, heart, lung, skin, there are subtypes of macrophages that are maintained locally in the tissue without input from monocytes. And lineage mapping has very nicely shown that these self-maintained macrophages have their origins in very early embryonic development, and in particular, through a population of embryonic yolk sac progenitor cells. Now, about two years ago, a group from Oxford published a lovely paper in Nature that demonstrated that these same embryonic yolk sac progenitor cells also give rise to endothelial line neovessels in the liver and the brain of postnatal mice. And so we have an interesting situation in early development where a common progenitor cell exists in early yolk sac, as shown for mice, that can produce both mature macrophages and mature endothelial cells that somehow persist into postnatal life and tissues. Now this concept of bipotency for macrophages and endothelial cells in development aligns with a century old concept, the concept first conceived in the 1920s of an embryonic stem cell called the hemangioblast. Uh, but up until now, no study has definitively been able to show that hemangioblasts persist into, uh, into adult life. So this is what we have set out to demonstrate for the last five or six years. Um, we really stumbled across uh, this project by studying the role of the vascular adventitia in contributing to vascular disease from the outside of the vessel in. And we were studying the stem cell niche within the adventitia 
of adult mouse aorta. And we identified that there's a population of stem cells in mouse adventitia that produces these colonies, these are macrophage colonies in methylcellulose, so hematopoietic uh, culture media. We very carefully tried to understand the phenotype of these stem cells forming these colonies and identified for the first time a unique surface marker fingerprint expressing key stem cell markers, see GIT and SCAR1, but quite interestingly, two receptors for macrophage growth factors that had been linked to those yolk sac progenitors I described earlier. Through a variety of in vitro and in vivo techniques, we demonstrated that these progenitor cells could form colonies at a single cell level, but more importantly, that they could self-renew uh, consistent with stem cell features. And we used a variety of techniques, including irradiation and adoptive transfer, but also lineage mapping using this FLIT3 pre-lock system to demonstrate that these adventitial progenitor cells that formed these CFUM were quite independent of bone marrow, blood, or other hematopoietic tissues such as spleen. Now, one of our very important findings was that these adventitial progenitor cells are most abundant in mice at the time of birth. Um, they persist throughout adult life, but gradually diminish with aging. And we have since identified these same progenitors in a variety of other uh, murine and subsequently human tissues, the brain, the heart, the lungs, the muscle, the skin. And in all cases, we've observed the same phenomenon. And so we've gone back to uh, use embryology to understand where these progenitors first arise. Uh, and we're blessed to have a great collaborations at UNSW and more recently with Natasha Harvey at, at the University of South Australia, where we've been able to map through embryology using our colony assays, uh, multicolor flow cytometry and immunostaining, the arrival of the CFUM progenitors initially in yolk sac at the 8.5 in mice, and then two days later, their appearance in a variety of uh, embryological tissues. So the embryonic aorta, where they reside adventitially, uh, the outflow tract of the heart, uh, around the air spaces in the lungs, uh, and in the deeper layers of the skin. We then used a technique called inducible crelox mapping uh, using two different uh, uh, promoter reporter systems in mice, one with the fractalkin receptor as a promoter, the other one with the receptor for MCSF. And we've induced uh, reporters in these mice uh, at very early embryological ages. And we've demonstrated that yolk sac progenitors for the first time give rise to a, the, our CFUM progenitors in all these different postnatal tissues. When we introduce disease into these tissues, such as the wound healing model that Chris referred to or the ischemic models, we find that these yolk sac derived progenitors expand very early within hours of injury and then subsequently, we see the arrival of macrophages and endothelial cells. And this has led us to speculate that our CFUM progenitors may in fact be the yolk sac derived ancestor of these locally maintained macrophages and endothelial cells. And we've demonstrated this in subsequent studies in vitro, for instance, this matrigel assay, where we take the progenitor cells, we grow angiogenic like cords in matrigel, and then using flow cytometry, we demonstrate the new formation of macrophage and endothelium. And then using a variety of adoptive transfer um, uh, disease models, we've been able to show the same in vivo. So this is an experiment where we take the aortic adventitial progenitors using a GFP label. We inject them into uh, hind limb muscle, which has been rendered ischemic. And we demonstrated that our progenitors are vasculogenic, improving the perfusion in muscle forming new macrophage and endothelial cells as identified by flow cytometry. And then using immunofluorescence and confocal microscopy, we can see intact, beautifully shaped neovessels formed by these progenitor cells with clusters of donor-derived macrophages speaking to their bipotency. Now, have we taken this to the bedside? Well, in collaboration with Rob Fittridge and Mike Worthington at uh, the Royal Adelaide, We've established vascular biobanks from coronary artery bypass graft patients and patients undergoing vascular surgery. And we've studied uh, vessels in adults, such as the internal mammary artery, uh, the saphenous vein and the aortic aneurysm. And we have found analogous progenitor cells in these different vessels, albeit in a rather vessel specific way. Now the cardiologists amongst you 
might recognise that saphenous veins are more prone to developing atherosclerosis than internal mammary arteries, and it follows that they have more of these progenitors, which are further increased in the setting of disease, namely uh, aortic aneurysm. And what this human work has done is to open up an entire new program of research for us by demonstrating that the presence of diabetes in these patients with vascular disease actually reduces the presence uh, stem-like characteristics and angiogenic capacity of these stem cells. And we've been able to go and study that in mice to understand how and why that happens. And we think that's got important implications for the way that diabetic blood vessels remodel and the way that diabetic tissues uh, are uh, fail to collateralize and repair, uh, unlike non-diabetic tissues. So we think that these stem cells that we've newly identified are problematic in some diseases and adaptive or healthy in others. So for example, our ongoing work with atherosclerotic models demonstrate that these stem cells expand about sixfold in atherosclerosis. They contribute to an adventitial inflammatory reaction. They develop vasa vasura that then infiltrate and destabilize plaque. Uh, working with Claudine Bonder at UniSA, we've studied the role of skin CFU and progenitor cells uh, in the setting of melanoma. We find that the progenitor cells expand in melanoma, they contribute and form neovessels shown here, and their presence increases the growth of melanoma tumors. Conversely, in the presence of skin wound and peripheral ischemia models that Chris described, we find that our progenitor cells also expand in these models, but this time they do so in a good way to produce new blood vessels and macrophages that facilitate and accelerate wound closure and perfusion. And we're currently in the process with Ginny Breen of, of analysing single cell sequencing data of these stem cells in different tissues and different disease models to understand the genes that upregulate and enrich in these populations under different conditions. The idea being that we'd like to develop treatments that upregulate these cells in conditions where they're needed and where they're helpful, and obviously dampen or downregulate them in, in conditions where uh, their response is unwanted. Uh, and so this is my last slide, just to show that we've developed this new paradigm whereby in embryology, there is a new population of stem cells seeded in tissues. They last all the way to adult life and they contribute to inflammatory and neovessel responses in a range of uh, conditions. Uh, and so uh, this is a photo of my group earlier in the year. I want to acknowledge the tremendous work that Anna Williamson has done as the PhD student leading this work uh, with support by Sonori in the area of skin work. Uh, and Deb Toledo, who really started this project for me, and Aaron Long, who got us into the human tissue. Thank you. Pete, that's yeah. fantastic. Again, another yeah. enormous amount of work. Um, we're close to time, but um, I thought we should take a few questions. Um, we have one from, uh, from the audience, from Jessica, who's asking, I presume, Chris, um, how do you make plaque unstable, Chris? Yeah, okay. So um, what happens is it's called tandem stenosis. So in the carotid artery of the neck, there's two sutures placed. It partially ligates uh, the uh, carotid artery uh, in two spots. And by doing that, it creates turbulence of the blood flow through that vessel. And that turbulence is what stimulates this unstable plaque. Um, so um, it has a phenotype that is typical of humans. It has a presence of red blood cells and, and shows fissures within, within the plaque. So that's, that's it. Thanks, Dr. Chris. Um, I have another quick question. Um, actually, there's one from Jessica again. Do the, do the hemangioblasts account for the non-lipid familial risk for the acute MI? That's a good question, Jess. Jess, we're, um, we're just starting to learn what they might mean in, uh, in human vessels. Um, I, I don't think that there's going to be too much of a hereditary element to these cells, but you never know. Um, amongst the uh, more, the tra more traditional clinical um, factors that associate with what these cells do, uh, diabetes has been the one that stands out, uh, but also angiotensin signaling. So angiotensin is an extremely potent driver of these stem cells. Um, and conversely, angiotensin inhibitors, uh, both the ones we use in clinic and other ones, are very effective at dampening um, what they do. So uh, probably not familial at this stage, but you never know. Um, Pete, I have a follow-up question to that a little bit, and that is whether or not these hemangioblasts 
might have a role, not so much, you've clearly focused very well and eloquently in, um, in large vessel disease, but I wonder about sort of microvascular disease and, um, and uh, you know, given the, given the high burden of catametabolic disease progressing now, whether or not um, we should be pursuing anything at a muscular level, if you like, not just at the myocardial muscular level, but also the skeletal muscular level. Do you think there's any yeah. and so we're doing a lot of work, uh, um, Sunuri's PhD and, and Anna's is focusing a lot on what happens in the skeletal muscle. So uh, the skeletal muscle has a lot of these uh, cells. They expand within two to three days of the ischemic model that uh, Chris described. And using a technique called BRDU pulse chase, um, we've been able to show that they proliferate quickly. And then over the following week, they first form macrophages and subsequently neovessels. Now in diabetes, um, our ex vivo data, we're about to do our in vivo experiments, shows that diabetes inhibits that response through probably mitochondrial reprogramming or to mitochondrial, mitochondrial damage. And so ideally we'd find treatments that rescue these cells in the setting of a condition like diabetes to improve their healing mechanisms. Interesting. Um, thanks for that. Um, there's a question from Peter. Can you culture the hemangioblasts indefinitely? Sam said, well, do you have to limit um, pluripotential? potential? Uh, so do they have a limited pluripotential? potential? That's a brilliant question from Paul. So Paul, when we um, culture these cells from yolk sac, embryonic tissue or neonatal tissue, we can get four or five um, passages in methyl cellulose with each passage being 14 days. So they do really well. Um, from an adult uh, mouse, that's brought down to two or three passages. So the older a mouse gets, um, um, the more limited that self-renewing capacity is. Of the different factors we've studied, angiotensin turns on primitive genes, namely CMIC and NAMOG, which stem cell reaches, researchers will recognise as uh, primitive genes involved in self-renewal. And in the presence of angiotensin II, these guys can self-renew for up to five different passages, analogous to what they do in embryonic life. So it is limited, um, although I think there are mechanisms in which that can be increased. Okay. Well, it looks like we're out of questions and over time. So at this point, what I might do is, is thank our speakers, Chris and Pete. Great presentations, enormous body of work. Should be incredibly proud of that work. Thank you very much to John Boltrami, who's chairing the uh, activities of the Biomed City uh, Research Review Reviews. Um, I hope these this has been uh, well received by the audience, and um, thank you very much. And tune in next week. <laughs>